to invite Professor Rippon to give her talk. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction, Patricia. Um, thank you very much to everybody here and to everybody wherever you are. And thank you very much to the Society for asking me. Um, um, just checking with the technology here. So um, I will get on fairly quickly without saying too much about myself because as ever, I've got lots and lots of things I want to share with you. And I've been told to strictly keep to time. So the question I'm going to be talking about tonight is, do you have a female brain or a male brain, or are we asking the wrong question? Um, and somebody said, could we have the take home message at the beginning, just in case you drift off or the technology fails? Um, so I will, spoiler alert, tell you that the answer is yes. Um, and actually what I'm gonna be talking about is why I think this is the wrong question. So um, as Patricia mentioned, I'm just finding that, this isn't actually me, I'll move it on here then. Okay. Slide is not, yes it is, good, okay. Um, just briefly to say I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. What that actually means is I use brain imaging techniques to um, investigate the relationship between brain and behavior. So it's not just looking at the anatomy of the brain, it's looking at um, you know, what this actually means, what differences in the brain actually means. And as Patricia said, my, my main work is actually looking at um, developmental disorders such as autism. And there's a great saying in the autism community that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So the idea is I want to know what makes brains different. And a lot of early neuroimaging was trying to find the common factor in everybody's brains, where was the language center or the memory center, et cetera. I'm really interested in understanding how brains get to be different on what that means for the owners of that brain. And I use techniques such as the old fashioned EEG. Um, and if this works, you can see obviously uh, a very old picture of me with a then very young daughter discovering the dangers of having a mother as a neuroscientist. Um, she has survived. Um, and we have more modern versions of that. Uh, MRI and fMRI with which I'm sure you're familiar, which is very good at looking structures at structures in the brain, and I will come back to that. Um, and a special system that we have at Aston, uh, which was one of the first labs in the country to have this system, which looks at the magnetic fields associated with brain activity. And that allows us to get these wonderful images, allows us to look at different structures, allows us to look at activity in different parts of the brain, etc. But with these techniques, we can actually look at intact living human brains in intact living humans and give them all sorts of different tasks, which they do have to carry out within scanners, although that is moving on a bit now. Um, but that's important to remember because I'm gonna take you back a bit in time in history to say where the original theories came from. And it was actually before we could um, look at intact living brains. So if you're asking questions about differences in the brain, the first thing, that people start to challenge you about is, well, there's this well-known difference in the brain, which we've known about for at least 200 years, that males and females have different brains, and from that, all sorts of consequences will stem, which I will go into. I decided to challenge this, because when I started looking at the research um, that had informed the ideas that we will be talking about, it struck me that there was all sorts of problems with this research. Now, the reason I'm going to give you a bit of a warning now is that my challenging the idea that there were male and female brains was not universally well received. Um, so I'm just going to share with you some of the comments that I got in case you decide you want to leave or switch off your computers. So the Telegraph, um, Christina Rodoni uh, said, this theory smacks of feminism with an equality fetish. Um, and I quite like the idea that if you're interested in equality, it's some kind of perverse practice. Uh, Daily Mail, straight to the point, grumpy old Harridan. Clearly, I've got some kind of agenda going here and, you know, clearly not a, a purely objective scientific um, uh, conclusion. 
New scientists, slightly surprising, and I've had to redact this slightly. This was a comment from a reader of an article I wrote on this issue in the New Scientist, uh, post-menopausal affirmative action loser, which did take me a bit by surprise, but then I thought, actually, that's New Scientist speak for grumpy old Harridan. So clearly there was some kind of consensus there. But my favorite is actually the Daily Mail again, uh, full of carp, um, which I'm assuming is a spelling mistake rather than a reference to my fish eating habits. So just to warn you, my conclusions has not been generally well received uh, by everybody. Um, so let's have a look at them and see whether or not you agree or whether or not you think I'm full of carp as well. So two issues to bear in mind, bear this, sort of tuck this away when you're listening to what I'm going to be saying. First of all, this whole issue of what we mean by different. Um, and that's really important because one of the issues that I am tackling at the moment is the language in this uh, research arena is really important. Because if you're a scientist, uh, significantly different means that you've done some kind of statistical manipulation and some kind of choice threshold has been passed um, and you can talk about things being different. But what we need to be aware is that when we talk to the you know, popular uh, in the popular press, for example, when we talk about things being different, people have a different understanding of what we mean by different. They mean men are like this and women are like that. And you get distributions a bit like this, um, where you can say in the top uh, here, you can actually say, I think I may need to change my, I can't do it here. Anyway, I was going to change the, the laser a bit. But effectively, what I'm going to be saying is that um, we are not talking about two quite distinct distributions of data, because you'd never say everybody's exactly the same. You would say there's a kind of distribution of those kinds of data. And normally uh, the top curves that I'm looking at here is height, for example. So overall, on average, men are taller than women. And you can get a distribution of data like that. And that's a reasonable statement to make, given those distributions, even though there is still an overlap. But if you look at the lower distribution, you can see lots of variability within the two populations, but a huge amount of overlap. So the average difference between them is really tiny. And actually, when we come to talk about sex differences, both in the brain and in behavior, which I'll be talking about as well, these are the kind of distributions of data we're looking at. So when people talk about you know, the, the female brain, even the most dyed in the wall essentialists, which we'll come back to, would agree that these are the kind of differences we're looking at. So they're really tiny. The other issue is the kind of questions we should be looking at, and I'll go through these quite quickly, because first of all, you need to ask the question, are there any sex differences in the brain? Which we'll see, a lot of people would say, we don't even need to ask that question. Of course, there are sex differences in the brain. But we'll maybe work backwards and see why they are so fixed on, on that truth as an absolute reality. Where do they come from? This is a very important issue as well. Are we looking at nature or nurture? Part of what I'm going to be saying is saying that this is actually a, an idea which is past its sell by date. Um, but is it the idea that these differences, such as they are, have arisen because of some kind of biological script, they're therefore natural and they shouldn't be changed? But actually what we're really interested in is what do they mean for the brain's owners? If you've got this kind of brain, are you empathic or a systemizer? Um, do you come from Mars or do you come from Venus? And we will come back to that as an idea. Are you good at map reading or multitasking? So that's important. The other important aspect to remember is why are we asking these questions? As I mentioned at the beginning, this is not an anatomy lecture to describe a male brain and a female brain, and these are the differences. We want to know why we're asking these questions. And that's because in hopefully in the closing stages of the talk, I'll actually want to be saying, um, because there's a, a lot of straw men set up in this, in this debate, and a lot of the people who are challenging the things that people like myself are saying is, we have to research sex differences in the brain because there are sex differences in brain disease. Many more women get Alzheimer's, many more men get Parkinson's, et cetera. And therefore people like you shouldn't um, deny researchers like us um, the, po the possibility of, of, of researching sex differences. I am absolutely not saying that there are no sex differences. I'm not a sex difference denier, but we need to say, where are we asking these questions? If we're looking at brain disease, sex differences could indeed have a powerful impact. If we're looking at sex differences in mental health, again, we could say there's a biological component, but how much is it also a function of the environment in which that brain is, is, is working? 
or are we asking about sex differences in society or what we now call gender gaps? And that is another issue. And when we look at data about gender gaps, we can see that even in the 21st century, the time it will take to close the world, for example, World Economic Forum every year produces um, uh, a report on gender gaps in over 150 countries and tracks the rate at which they're changing with a hopefully optimistic view of how long it will take till the whole world um, is gender equal. Um, 2020 report, it said the time it will take to close the world wide gender gap uh, is 99.5 years. 2021 report post-pandemic post with all sorts of effects, um, it's now risen to 135.6 years. So a whole generation moved on. So a really important issue to be looking at. So what we really need to do, and I thought I, given that this is the Royal Philosophical Society, Francois Poulain de la Barre should have a, have a mention, a brave philosopher who in the 17th um, century said, having looked at the emerging understanding of different kinds of anatomy and how that might relate to behavior, slightly before we understood about the brain, he said, I'm going to have a look at the evidence in this area. And what counts as evidence is not because it's always been like that, or not because it says it in the Bible. Um, so I think he was one of the first people who pointed out that, you know, um, anecdote does not equal evidence or the plural of anecdote does not equal evidence. So he actually came up with the idea that there was no reason why males and females shouldn't achieve equally and have uh, equal uh, access to, you know, cognitive skills, etc. So he wrote this great book, uh, The Mind Has No Sex. Unfortunately, um, he then disappeared into obscurity as along with his ideas. And we come straight into the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, when uh, researchers were understanding about the relationship between brain and behavior and a newer uh, brain science was being established. And the researchers at that point were saying, we'll have a look at the status quo. Um, we'll see the difference between men and women. And then we'll work backwards and explain where these differences come from. So they actually looked at the status quo and they said, um, women clearly are inferior to men. And that was quite clearly stated as we can see here, um, because they were, because they didn't have access to education or financial independence, or political representation, et cetera. So they said, what we need to do as scientists is to explain the inferiority of the female brain. Now, people very often have a picture of scientists as being logical, rational, objective. So I will just draw your attention to the um, sentiments of particular scientists in this area when they're asking this question. So women represent the most inferior forms of human evolution, closer to children and savages than to an adult civilized man. And similarly, uh, there are occasionally bright women, but so rare they're like a gorilla with two heads which was actually one of the names I wanted to give to my book, The Two-Headed Gorilla, but that was voted down. But the scientists at the time then said, right, let's develop the kind of metrics which could explain why female brains uh, are inferior. Didn't have access to intact living human brains. They only had access to dead brains, which they could weigh or they could um, measure bits of it once they've cut the brains open or they could look at the skulls of living people and say maybe something about the surface of their skulls might tell us something about what the brain is like inside. So big flurry of activity in this Hunt the Difference agenda, which said we really must find out why female brains are inferior. And the interesting thing to bear in mind is that the first finding they had was that on average, thinking back to this, the graph I showed you earlier, um, male brains are about five ounces heavier than females? The answer, bigger is better, characteristic of this kind of argument in this area. Therefore, men were clearly superior because they had, on average, bigger brains. And then somebody pointed out that actually sperm whales and elephants had bigger brains than human males and were not generally renowned for their intellectual superiority. And therefore, they had to rethink the metric. They had to say, well, maybe it's a ratio of the brain size to the body size, et cetera. And so on and on with phrenology and craniology, measuring different angles between ear lobes and tip of the nose, et cetera. But the important point to remember is that there was clearly an agenda here. There was an idea that we had to say, um, whatever hierarchy was produced by these metrics at the top of that hierarchy had to be white, 
because it intersected with questions about race, upper class, because it intersected with um, uh, uh, questions about class as well, males. So there was an idea of what the answer had to be. And there is clear evidence that if any metric used didn't come up with that answer, the metric was discarded. So it was clear that there was definitely a gender in, in, in this particular um, debate, which started at this point. Joining in on this as well was uh, the emergence of experimental psychologists who said, well, let's generate a nice go-to list of differences between males and females in terms of their skills, their um, role in society, their abilities, etc., cetera, um, and generated the kind of list that actually, if you stopped a lot of people now and said, what's the difference between males and females, they would equally you know, come up with a, the sort of list that will, as we'll see later, became familiar. So you've got, again, these kind of comments for these supposedly objective males, I have to say. Uh, we must start with the realization that as much as women want to be good scientists or engineers, they want first and foremost to be womanly companions of men and to be mothers. And this was... Um, uh, evidence given to an American society looking at uh, the commitment required of a woman entering a scientific profession. So this area is littered with clear, very fixed beliefs in the people who were doing the research who didn't at that point have access to the organs that they were talking about. Right, moving swiftly on then, Despite all of this, despite not having access to a living intact human brain, clear chain of argument was quickly uh, generated. And this is what I call the inside out model, the idea that all these differences were because of something going on inside the brain. Whatever it was at that stage, uh, we didn't know about uh, didn't know about genotypes, etc. determined differences between male and female anatomy, also determined the differences between brains. Later on, that was um, written into the, this was fueled by different kinds of levels of hormones, which we will come back to. So if you had a female anatomy, you had a lady brain. If you had a male anatomy, you had a manly brain. And associated with that was a kind of collection, a portfolio of abilities and skills or lack of ability and skills. So if you had a lady brain, you were very good at understanding emotion, very good at networking, but rubbish at reading maps. Whereas if you had a manly brain, you were very good at kind of scientific thinking, very good at spatial uh, organization, etc., but not very good at listening or, or, or understanding emotions, etc. So the idea was that we had a very clear link, causal link. This was inevitable. Inevitably, female anatomy meant female brain. Female brain meant empathic, for example. And if you were that kind of person, then you were going to get a particular sort of role in society, a caring role, nurturing role, more likely to be a nurse, primary school teacher, etc. Whereas if you had a manly brain, as I said, there's a portfolio of skills, which meant you were much more likely to be hugely highly achieving scientist, an explorer, certainly a, a leader a leader of the world, etc. So logical, rational, and so forth. So this was the chain of argument, the, what I've called the inside out uh, model. And if you like using the term gender, which we might come back to at the end, this was how sex, the biological differences, got to be gender. Gender in terms of what is expected of us in society, our identity, uh, the expectations that society has of us, etc. And there was a very clear idea that how fe female brains got to be different from male brains. They were born different, different sizes, slightly different sizes, but certainly different characteristics, bearing in mind again that we didn't have access to intact living infant brains. brains boy brains arrived in the world with certain kind of skills, which they um, improved by being allowed to be exposed to education. And then there was a fixed developmental endpoint, at which point you got the kind of brain that meant you were, um, uh, you know, you were logical, rational, a great scientist, etc. Whereas if you were a female, you had a slightly softer, more um, fragile brain, shouldn't be exposed to the exigencies of higher education if you listen to 19th century researchers. But the idea was that that brain would grow up to give that person a particular role in society, particularly to do with being logical, emotional, and I cheekily put the kind of princess meme, meme on there um, to demonstrate these kind of differences. So there was a very clear belief about these differences between males and females. 
And these were supported by books at the time. There's a book called The Essential Difference. And I noticed Patricia stressing essential because essential means in those terms, actually some kind of biological um, characteristic. But I bet if I'd stopped any of you coming in and said, what do you think essential means? You would probably think this is something really important, something that we must have. And so calling a book The Essential Difference is something of a challenge, which I'll come back to. Opening lines of that book, the female brain, so there is such a thing, is hardwired, so it's fixed, for empathy, this is what females can do. The male brain is hardwired for understanding systems, so a very clear statement from a scientist writing um, for uh, a popular, for the popular audience, but with clear scientific beliefs. And then you get the classic granddaddy theme, which comes up time and time again, how different men and women are to the different the extent that they could come from different planets. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And if any science came up with proving that, the headline was always something like, at last, the truth, you know, scientists have caught up. So this is a belief very firmly fixed in the public consciousness. But along comes brain imaging, the kind of techniques that I showed you at the beginning that I've been using. And therefore we should at this stage say, fantastic, we can now really look at the brain. We should take a step back, see, find out what we can think about the brain, understand the brain in greater depth. But unfortunately, the, hunt, the difference agenda continued. So it was still the case that very early brain studies were still looking at the differences between males and females. So we're still saying, let's find what makes a brain female, what makes a brain male. If we actually look at the data that's been collected since the 1990s, um, when brain imaging arrived, you could say, well, the story is looking good. There's thousands of papers which have headlines such as sex differences in the adult human brain, which are then picked up by the popular press. Proof at last, scientists have caught up. Women and men are born to be different. So you get an amazing impression that scientists are agreeing with this hunt the difference agenda. But if you start looking at those papers, you can see that actually the story is never the same. So you get thousands of papers, and I mean thousands, but then you start saying, well, these people are reporting a difference in that part of the brain, that group is talking about that part of the brain, that group is saying males haven't got a bigger amygdala, amygdala start again, amygdala, males have got a bigger amygdala, et cetera. And you start to think there isn't any kind of consistency here. And the other thing you have to bear in mind, which is why I'm characterizing it by an iceberg, also known as the file drawer problem, if you're actually starting off by looking for a difference and you don't find it, then it's quite likely that you don't publish or you might submit it to be published and the reviewers will say there must be something wrong with what you're doing because you haven't found a difference. And everybody knows there's a difference. So there's a huge amount of research which isn't published. Or even in the published papers, if you look at the thousands of, of comparisons that are possible in published papers, if you actually drill into them, you can see the only thing they talk about are where they do find differences. But on average, 80% of the comparisons they make, maybe more, report no differences. And if you think of the last few, you know, the last few months, if somebody had said, well, this vaccine works 10% of the time, but not 90%. You wouldn't be terribly impressed with the conclusion that we must all use this vaccine, but that's exactly what we're doing. And just recently, um, there's been a paper which came out, looked at, reviewed all of the findings over the last 30 years, looked at the size of the differences, the consistency of the story, came up with this amazing title, Dump the Dimorphism. There is no clear evidence that there is a difference between a male and a female brain. I can't look at a, a brain or a brain scan and say, well, that's a male, that's a female. If a, brain, a male or a female comes to my lab, I can't say this is what their brain will look like. This is what their, their brain will look like. So that's important to remember. So that part of the argument hasn't stood the test of time. And the same thing has happened with the uh, experimental psychologist go-to list. Let's have a look at this belief that women are much more good at verbal tasks, um, good at being emotional or empathic. Men are much better at um, logical, rational reasoning, etc. even measures of masculinity and femininity. So again, looking at the kind of metrics that have been used to, to, to come up with this answer, same observation has we have arrived at. Men and women are much more similar than they are different. 
And again, another great title, Black and White or Shades of Grey, Are Gender Differences Categorical or Dimensional? Those data, overlapping data that I showed you earlier, of course, make sense of this. Huge amount of variability within the two populations, huge overlap, much more likely that you can better characterize those differences, either by talking about mosaic type brains, lots and lots of different brains with lots and lots of differences between, you know, within the groups, or you can actually have a single dimension. Right, moving on, as I've been told to stick to time. But of course, the end of the argument is about male, female brains, male, female abilities. What about gender gaps? What about those roles at the end? Can we get rid of those as well? Well, unfortunately, and of course, this is why this is still an issue. It is the case that gender gaps in the world are still evident, are in fact getting larger, one of the areas I'm passionate about is the underrepresentation of women in science. And despite all sorts of well-meaning initiatives, and perhaps we can talk about that at the end, there is still a vast representation of underrepresentation of women in science. The top um, kind of technological um, groups like uh, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, et cetera, if you look at the leadership, women in leadership in those roles, or the um, women in technical roles, vast underrepresentation. A report this year from UNESCO, from UNESCO looking at the kind of future proofing of science and looking at the changes in the proportion of men and women in the what they call the emerging technologies like robotics and artificial intelligence, content management, et cetera. In, in some cases, the representation of women in those subjects is actually going backwards. So clearly there's something that we really need to understand. We can't just get rid of, you know, if we're just interested in anatomical argument, I could stop now and we could have lots and lots of questions. But I think this is something we need to say that neuroscience can help, still help, but we need to get away from some earlier ideas. Now, these are the kind of new, thinkings, thoughts about the brain that have emerged since we've had access to intact living human brains. And that's an understanding about how the brain works, bearing in mind that we all thought that brains all worked in the same way. There was some kind of internal program which was playing out, which reached a fixed developmental endpoint. And that our brains were for something in particular, particularly cognitive. So individual skills, giving you language, creativity, et cetera. We need to get away from that idea if we're going to try and tackle the kind of gender gaps, which I think are a problem. And these are the three P's that I've come up with. So apologies if alliteration sets your teeth on edge. But this is to say that our brains are like predictive textures. We used to think, well, we know that the brains are hugely efficient information processes, but we thought they were kind of passive recipients. We now know that brains are much more like um, self-organizing systems, if you're going to use artificial intelligence type terms, they're learning rules all the time. They are monitoring the outcome of any particular incoming sensation or the outcome of any particular action, generating rules based on that and driving their owners around according to those predictions. So it's not actually receiving, it's actually saying, what's going on in the outside world? This is what you should do. Similarly, we know that our brains are plastic. I mentioned developmental endpoints, and it was assumed that once our brains had stopped growing, nothing changed in those brains. The right connections were in place, unless there had been any kind of damage or, or deprivation. Um, and there were differences in how these brains had developed, but gradually, you know, your skills emerged and they were entrenched and nothing was going to change those. So once your brain has stopped growing. But we now know that our brains are plastic in terms of flexible or moldable, and that the experiences we have throughout our lives, right up to the uh, the unfortunate cognitive cliff that some of us are closer to than others, where the brain starts stops functioning quite as well as it has done. But even that we now know is not as inevitable as we assumed. So we know that things that you do will change the brain. And the classic stories about London uh, taxi drivers learning the knowledge where they can actually demonstrate that the amazing visuospatial feat that they learn, the knowledge, um, actually changes the brain, the structure and the function. But interestingly, when they stop being taxi drivers, those differences disappear. So our brains wax and wane, wane according to the uh, experiences that we've had, or they won't change if we haven't had those experiences. The other thing we know is that our brains, the third P, our brains are permeable. They don't just process 
if presented with a problem in a completely vacuum packed way. They will take account of the context in which that problem is presented. So if you say to a group of people, if I was gonna put somebody in a scanner and say, um, people like you uh, have difficulty with these kind of tasks, but I want to see what happens to your brain when you solve this particular problem. Or you say to another group, exactly the same task, people like you are really good at these kind of tasks, so I want to see how your brain is solving this problem. So exactly the same problem. People who've been given the positive message, um, unsurprisingly, probably, uh, do much better on the task and make fewer errors. And the parts of their brain which are activated are the appropriate areas of the brain for the problem presented. People who've been given the negative message make many more errors, therefore they underperform. And the parts of their brain that are activated are much more to do with emotional control centers um, and error monitoring systems. And therefore they don't, their brain is not performing as efficiently as it should. So the same task, but the social context. The other aspect of the um, brain that we now have come to understand is what is the brain for, as well as the way in which it works. We'd always assume that the brain, understanding the human brain, was understanding how we acquired cognitive skills like language, science, ability to do science, problem solving. We now know that actually one of the advantages the human brain is, the evolution has given the human brain is it makes us social. We work much better together as teams, we collaborate much more, we have many more intricate social networks, etc. And the parts of the brain, the evolutionarily youngest parts of the brain at the front, are those parts of the brain which are activated by social experiences, by uh, for example, understanding social norms, how you should behave in social situations, how you could get to belong to what seems to be your in-group. So a sense of self, a sense of other people, understanding other people. And we know that within the brain, there is a network which actually informs that particular social behavior. So we have the, I've characterized them as a kind of Pixar figures here. So we still have the kind of evolutionarily oldest emotional part of the brain, which is coding, helpfully coding the outcome, bearing in mind the predictions of particular social events. And what's a good thing for you if you're gonna be part of a social norm and what's a bad thing for you as well. And monitoring the interaction between the coding system and the outcome system, is what I've characterized as a, a traffic light system here, the anterior cingulate cortex for those of you who like the anatomical terms. And that's where I've spent a lot of my research time. There is a system in the brain which acts a bit like traffic lights or, or um, uh, railway point systems. And one of the things it does a lot is inhibit behavior if it is coded in a, some kind of negative way. So it's a system where mistakes are noted and monitored and before a behavior is corrected, so those mistakes are not um, repeated. And similarly, that's just with a cognitive tasks, but also with social tasks as well. So galloping through this, these are the kind of tasks that I've been involved with um, in trying to understand what it is that makes people behave in a social way and what the impact of negative social experiences are. So when I kind of put this list together and talk to colleagues about the kind of things we do to our participants, it strikes me that actually we're quite unpleasant because we put people in the scanner and we make them experience social rejection. Even if it's like playing a little video game where they appear to be rejected by the other players, or we make them think about a mistake they've made and how much do they think it was really their fault. Or think about yourself in your hierarchy at work are you, you know, whereabouts are you on the kind of ladder of self-esteem? Or we say to uh, people, um, you know, we can get them to listen into or to play a Tinder type task, for example. You can swipe right on somebody, a picture that you think, oh, I quite like to go out with that person. And then you're shown an image of that person swiping left on you. So we do our best to make our participants feel bad, which is not pleasant, but informative in a particular way, hopefully, as I'll, I'll show you. So the key thing about this is that part of the brain which is activated and which is demonstrated here in the, in the uh, colored areas is the part of the brain I was talking about, the, the traffic light system. It's also the part of the brain which is activated by real pain. So a real negative driver within the brain. So social behavior or negative social experiences do have a very powerful effect on human behavior. <laughs> 
And we can demonstrate this by saying, if you actually look at those parts of the brain and then you look at people who have particular social difficulties, so we are not just looking at brain activity, we're looking at people who for clinical reasons, for example, have poor self-image, people who have very sensitive to being rejected or always anticipating rejection in some way, people who have very high levels of self-criticism, people who are characterized by some form of self-silencing, feeling, you know, this is really not something I'm very good at, um, who tend to withdraw from situations, who suffer from, for example, imposter syndrome, etc. And therefore you say, well, the brain, we need to pay much more attention to what's going on outside the brain in order to understand the kind of gender gaps we're looking at. We can't assume that these gaps have arisen just by some kind of vacuum packed biological script inevitably uh, unfolding within each individual. We need to be aware that the brain is constantly monitoring what is going on in the outside world. And therefore we come up, or I have come up with this, what I call the world as a brain influencer, the outside in model of the brain, where we're still looking at brain processes, but we're looking at how those brain processes have been molded by a gendered world, for example. We could be talking about anything. We could be talking about other kind of experiences of, of, of disability or being a, a member of ethnic minority. And sometimes when I'm giving this talk to schools, et cetera, I say, let's stop here. And you could fill in what kind of thing you think might be in the outside world, particularly if you're interested in gender gaps. Do we live in a gendered world? Is the 21st century characterized by all sorts of emphases on whether you're male or whether you're female? And I'll just fill in some quick examples here because I'm going to go on and see if I can enlist your help in a puzzle. So first of all, the classic, um, just how gendered do we think the world is, the whole pink and blue tsunami. Um, I haven't got time to go into my characteristic rant about gender reveal parties. You know, 20 weeks before tiny humans arrive on this planet, we're already labeling us whether they're boys or girls, they'll play football or be princesses, etc. Similarly, the kind of cards you get when you have either a male or a female baby. Toys, very important. And in fact, it's interesting that just recently, Lego has announced that they have started to realize, having really emphasized uh, and focused, targeted their marketing onto boys, that these kind of toys are actually very important for all kinds of skills. And they are actually part of, uh, sustaining stereotypes, gender stereotypes by marketing only to boys. And this is actually very interesting because I mentioned earlier the idea that a particular kind of spatial thinking underpins science and men are very good at the spatial thinking and that's why there are more scientists or less female scientists. But what we now know is that actually, if you look at so-called robust sex differences in the brain, um, such as visuospatial thinking as monitored here by this kind of task. But if you then take into account the kind of spatial training opportunities that people have had, you then say, let's have a look at the kind of toys that people played with. Let's have a look at the occupations they have, the sports they play, is there a spatial element? And there was a big survey done in the States which looked at spatial cognition, came up with the, on average, males do better than females. But when they factored in the kind of spatial training opportunities that toy play or, or sports, etc., uh, would bring to these individuals, the sex differences disappeared. So in fact, what looks like a sex difference is, is actually very much to do with a kind of experience that particular brains have had. And if, of course, those experiences are gendered and you're more likely to be uh, to play with Super Mario or Lego if you're a boy, um, then maybe that's why you're better at spatial training opportunities. I've just got time to say, well, um, Mattel has acknowledged that and they did think, well, there is an underrepresentation of women in science. So we'll solve this by uh, producing Barbie the engineer. Um, so we have here Barbie the engineer with a very short lab coat and an even shorter miniskirt. It has got DNA patterns on. I don't know if you can see that, but it makes her sciencey. Um, but what's interesting in terms of how many people look at this and think this was a good idea, um, in order to encourage girls into science, A, you've got Barbie the engineer, B, what can Barbie the engineer build? She can build a pink washing machine or a pink jewelry carousel. So I leave that out there with you to think, is our world gendered? 
And there's a whole other issue too, if you look at schools, I was part of a BBC documentary three or four years ago now, went into a classroom full of six-year-olds, looked at the extent of gender stereotyping quite unconsciously in how the boys and girls were treated, um, the expectations they had of each other at the age of six, girls saying um, boys could grow up to be president, maths is a boy thing, um, girls being the lack of self-esteem in girls at the age of six was really quite distressing. And then they took these stereotypes out of the classroom for just six weeks and made quite a dramatic difference, which is good to hear. I've also mentioned the idea that women are underrepresented in science, um, and I just quickly show you this show, the rogues gallery, I won't go into it in detail, but very often you get these kind of public proclamations from males, I have to say, um, for example, Larry Summers, then president of Harvard, different availability of aptitude at the high end, explaining why there weren't great women mathematicians and engineers, James Damore, the Google engineer saying Google shouldn't be wasting its time trying to encourage diversity within Google because uh, there was a different uh, distribution of, of preferences and abilities in part due to biological causes. Physicist uh, stood up in CERN two years ago and said physics uh, was wasting its time trying to encourage women to do physics because physics is a man subject um, and therefore we should acknowledge this. So I'll move on from the rest of this. So you should say, okay, in my closing stages, I can say the female braid is dead. So in answer to the question, are we asking the wrong question? Are we asking the, are, is your brain male or female? Are we asking the wrong question? The answer is yes. And you think, great, we can move on. We can really say, this is a time to understand where these gender gaps are coming from. What is a more interesting question to ask? But sadly, and hence the, the, the title of this slide, the female brain is dead, but long live the female brain. So despite you know, efforts of people like me writing a book called The Gendered Brain and all sorts of other people, and this huge survey saying there is no difference structurally between males and female brains, we're still getting a big pushback by saying, you are wrong. We have known for 200 years that men and women have got different brains and therefore you are doing something wrong. So a bit like, you know, the metric being dumped if you didn't come up with the right answer. And the kind of accusations are sexism fears hamper brain research. So I have actually been accused of being a feminazi who is under, under, uh, undermining research into conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's by saying there are no sex differences, so stop researching them. Absolutely not. And that's why I raised the issue at the beginning. Why are we asking this question? If we're looking at brain-based differences, we should really drill into why we're not finding the differences. What is a better way of characterizing people who are more likely to get Alzheimer's or people who are more likely to get Parkinson's disease? And something which has emerged recently um, with respect to the pandemic is what you might think that I would say, you know, as a feminist, isn't it great that now people are saying, the female brain, the female leadership, um, women in leadership, the power of the female brain. So we've still got this kind of argument going on that there is such a thing as the female brain being given a positive spin, if you like, saying uh, countries led by females seem to have done better with the pandemic. You know, I think that's an issue which will continue to be debated for some time. But the idea of the female brain is powerfully there. And similarly, in terms of um, an issue that I mentioned uh, earlier is the idea that um, huge underrepresentation of women in science. Just recently, some attention has been drawn or has been drawn to the idea that there is a paradox. If we assume that the underrepresentation of women in science is something to do with poor access to education or some kind of lack of expectation in, in a gendered world, how come in the countries which have the narrowest gender gap, still um, not equal, like Finland, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, proportionally they have the biggest underrepresentation of women uh, in science. So the idea is that there is a paradox here. And the statement made is that science has leveled the playing field or you know, gender equality gaps have, have reduced uh, any differences between men and women's opportunities and expectations, leveled the playing field, women are still choosing not to do science. And there is a, what I call a neo-essentialist argument here saying, okay, we've kind of lost the argument about male and female brains having different competencies. 
But maybe we should sort of talk about preferences. Women prefer people and men prefer things. So those of you who are scientists in the argument might kind of object a bit to this kind of understanding that women prefer to work with people and that's why they don't do science. The implication being that science is nothing to do with people. Um, and there is also the, the observation that women tend to be better at uh, reading literary scores. So the competencies in these groups have been matched. Women and, and uh, girls and boys do just as well on tests of science, but girls tend to do better on literacy studies. So the suggestion is that women are turning away from science because they're going to get a greater, and I quote, sense of efficacy and joy uh, by pursuing their literary um, abilities. And you think that's another interesting way of characterizing science. So just moving on to the end stages here. So we have these kind of emerging ideas, the female brain remains, we've got still an argument, we must find some kind of biological argument, we must hang on to the idea that there's male and female differences and find some kind of biological explanation. And this is what I call the um, whack-a-mole problem in that uh, in the book when I talk about trying to get rid of uh, research findings that you know are wrong. There is an amazing stickability um, in the world about science and very early science um, observations. I'll just see if this works. It should actually, it does, yes, okay. So I don't know if you know the whack-a-mole game where somebody is a, a game where you think, all right, here comes the mole, I've whacked it on the head. So this is me writing saying, this research isn't very good, we should forget it. And then the next day you read something in the paper where that research is quoted. This area is full of examples of that and the scientific papers which come up with the idea that male and female brains are different. Those are much more popular and remembered than papers saying, you know, there is something wrong with that particular study. As we've mentioned earlier, and I've got just, yes, uh, time, the neurotrash problem. And this is about communication. This is about the translation from scientific journals to popular communication, bearing in mind that one of the things in the outside world is a continued belief in differences between males and females. And if this is fed by science, that belief will be sustained and it will also become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I give talks in schools where girls talk about um, not having a science brain or not being, you know, maths being a boy thing. So there's a couple of examples here to give you an example of what we're up against. So a very, a paper um, came out in 2018, brain regulates social behavior differences in males and females. Clear statement, helpfully uh, illustrated with the classic pink and blue brain. And it's not until you get, I think it's about the fourth paragraph, and if you can see that, in this study conducted in hamsters, um, the researchers investigated the hypothesis, etc. And there is now a website, I think it's called Only in Mice, where somebody does actually report all of these papers, which talk about sex differences, but they're only in mice. But that's not a, a website which lots of people spend a lot of time accessing. And this is something I was involved in quite recently, where um, I was asked by a colleague to review a paper which was looking at estrogen receptor cells in a particular part of the brain in female mice. And it was only in female mice and it wasn't a very good paper. Um, and we did point out that, you know, as it was only carried out in female mice, the kind of um, interpretation of the data was questionable. And this is something I'll come on to very shortly. And that's how scientists themselves describe things. So having rejected this paper and said, I, I don't really think it's, it's telling the story that you think, I was then sent a Google alert and I hope there's not too many people with great sensitivity here. Um, science explains why some people are into BDSM and some aren't. Do you like the rough stuff even in the bedroom, et cetera? So I was sent this is, this is supposedly a difference between male and female brains. And very often in those studies, it's quite those uh, headlines, it's quite difficult to track back where that, um, that scientific statement came from. So I was very surprised to find that that headline was informed by the paper about estrogen receptor cells in female mice. So you can kind of understand what we're up against in trying to fight this. And again, not to go into this in too much detail given the time, the language we've talked about, we talked about differences. Sometimes scientists will report the kind of differences here where you've got hugely overlapping 
distributions of data, tiny little average differences, and they will talk about fundamental sex differences in the structural architecture of the human brain. Or they will talk about um, one particular paper, the, the paper you can see on the, on the right of the screen, where actually the brain imaging data, the brain imaging study they carried out allowed them to make 34,716 different comparisons and 178 of them were significant. And that's all they talked about. Sex differences in functional connectivity are prominent. These data provide novel evidence, et cetera, et cetera. So scientists themselves under pressure to show how their research has impact um, actually over egg the pudding. And the essential difference, which I've already talked about, told about the opening state, opening lines was that males, um, uh, hardwired for systemizing. Later on in the book, the author tells us you don't have to be female to have a female brain. You don't have to be male to have a male brain. At which point you think language really matters in this argument. Why are you using those terms and sustaining that particular um, evidence? So closing then, can we finally stop talking about male and female brains? Headline in the New York Times uh, in 2018, recent research is making it clearer than ever that the notion that sex determines the fundamentals of brain structure and behavior is a misconception. And yet, and yet, the female brain is dead. Long live the female brain. So hopefully some of you will be able to explain to me how we can move this debate on. Thank you very much. Stop sharing. Right. All right. <laughs> right. Thank you. I hope that that has given both the audience here in the room and the at least 159 people watching from home um, some thoughts of questions. So um, you have a few minutes in which to think about your questions, and we will be starting again within five minutes. So, thank you. Right, we are going to start the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the floor here. And please do remember that I have to try and repeat them for the audience at home. So do we have any questions from the floor? Richard will bring the microphone to you. Just. Can't hear, sorry. I can't, can't hear, sorry. Um, the obvious hormonal differences um, is that in the parents, the heart of brain, the brain, the brain, the brain, the the brain, the brain, the brain, the the brain, 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 the are hormonal differences being taken into account? That's a very important question. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, one of the interesting things, I mean, I didn't obviously, because it's a long talk anyway, the whole other talk about hormones, um, mentioned very briefly the idea that, you know, whatever it was that determined anatomical differences also determine brain differences. And that, of course, is the hormone story because the male fetus is exposed to testosterone uh, in utero, um, is born with male genitalia, and the next stage theory was that the brain had been organized differently as well um, as the anatomic, other anatomical differences. Most of the work, and in fact, I call the 20th century, sometimes the raging hormone um, century, because very much there was a big, in the 1920s, understanding of how hormones affected behavior, a big uh, emphasis on differences between males and females, uh, and this is in non-human animals with respect to their respective roles in the reproductive process and how that could be manipulated by um, removing, you know, altering hormone levels in, in, in male and female fetuses or male or female animals. So a lot of the understanding about hormones came from the study of non-human animals. And one of the things we know, a bit like plasticity of the brain, 
is that hormones in humans are much more responsive to the social context than hormones in non-human animals. Um, for example, um, testosterone levels in the fathers of newborn babies are lower uh, in the fathers who are the primary carer of those babies, as opposed to fathers who are not the primary carer of those babies. So the same social event, but the um, context of that event has a, a more powerful effect on hormone levels. So yes, hormones are very important. They, the term hormone means drive to action. And yes, females and males have different hormone levels. Females and males, uh, we talk about male and female hormones, which is actually a bit of a misnomer. Um, and there, Cordelia Fine has written a, a great book called Testosterone in Rex, where she has looked at all the evidence with respect to non-human animals and humans, and how far we can translate um, research from non-human animals into humans, and how good or bad the research in humans is. So yes, hormones are important. And one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that um, hormones also determine physical characteristics, and that can be things like upper body strength and weight and height, etc. And our brains don't float around in a, in, in a vacuum, they float around in a body. And how the, hum the human society is organized is that people respond differently to different bodies, they use their bodies differently. So that aspect of it is, is very important. Whether or not we can use that kind of information to explain the kind of gender gaps that we're talking about in terms of um, political representation or underrepresentation of women in science is another issue. Um, and I think it's again, with respect to looking at brains, we need to say how important or how primary are these hormone differences in the kind of gender gaps we're looking at. Do we have another question from the floor? We do. So the question is following on from that, are the differences then because of hormone levels such as from adolescence to adulthood and following the menopause in women? Uh, yes, is the short, the, yes is the short answer. Although again, it's very interesting. Um, I mean, I think the menopause is, is, is very timely. Uh, it's quite a, a hot topic at the moment, particularly with respect to um, a business organizations um, and allowance for um, the physical characteristics of, of, of the menopause. Uh, Premenstrual tension was as a similar sort of area, again, in the late um, 20th century, where it was very often claimed, and I mean, there were claims, is, wasn't it lucky that, um, I should think how many people might remember the, the Bay of Pigs Cuban crisis, wasn't it lucky there wasn't a menopausal female in charge of, 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 of the nuclear button at the time, you know, given how well the males dealt with it, but we'll leave that to one side. Um, so it was very often used as a kind of argument to explain, you know, why and very early on, again, in the 18th, 19th century, women had these kind of amazing cycles of, of, of emotional problems um, that this meant we shouldn't give them any kind of power or authority. Uh, it's very, again, interesting in that there was, if you look at the context of premenstrual tension, for example, it almost can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's what we call in the social psychologists we call attribution theory. So if you could have something like a menstrual cycle on which you could pin explanations for behavior, um, then very often that's how behavior was explained. So um, women weren't angry because they were angry, they were angry because they were premenopausal, and therefore you could dismiss um, the reason for their anger, for example. But also it's the case that you could trick women into believing they were premenopausal, they were premenstrual by um, manipulating physiological feedback they were given. And then they started explaining any kind of behavioral problems they were having or emotional problems in terms of their belief 
that they were premenstrual. So again, there's a kind of idea that our hormones are much more sensitive to what else is going on. It's not just a, an automatic response. So those are the kind of issues as well. But I think it's again the case that there are physical changes associated with hormones in both males and females. Um, and the interpretation of those physical changes can lead to uh, differences in behavior, which look as though they're confirming the driving, that uni, you know, the unidirectional driving force of hormones, as opposed to the fact that the, the cycling, that the, the sort of feedback effect they appear to be having. So we can't dismiss them, and I wouldn't, but sometimes we need not to just use that particular part of, of biology as, as an explanation. We're going to take a few questions from um, our online audience now, but we will come back to questions from the floor here. So the first question we're going to take is, are there any significant differences in response to negative message experiments? Um, yes, I mean, I think the, the, the permeable brain that I talked about um, is a really nice illustration of that, that if there's a people like you context or a negative expectation or girls not expecting to do well in maths because maths, maths is a boy thing, um, there is a theory uh, called stereotype threat, um, which is a social psychology concept which emerged in uh, 1980s, 1990s, um, which is, I think, have been over attributed its power but it is the case, particularly if you look at the brain imaging studies, because I would believe that brain imaging studies were, if you like, a powerful backup for these explanations, that if there is a negative uh, expectation, um, then you are much more likely to demonstrate the kind of self-criticism, self-withdrawal, underperformance, um, which we can track as being driven by the brain, if you like. Um, so yes, I, th I think, um, there's a question that I find quite interesting. Um, somebody can't understand the reason why the female presence in science in countries such as Norway and Iceland is low, even though in other respects, there is quite high equality yep. there. Okay, well, that is, if you like, the gender equality paradox that has been receiving quite a lot of attention because the idea is that these countries are somehow ideal and, and the playing field has been leveled. There is another whole talk in that, in this how level is the playing field in science? And actually there's a lot of attention looking at, for example, um, the reward systems within science. Um, so people who get the biggest grants, people who are the lead authors on papers, um, the citation indices, et cetera, the papers that are written. All of those rewards within which then get you to progress within science, clear evidence of gender bias. And a lot of the big journals like the Springer Nature Group are, have, have actually started carrying out really interesting surveys and demonstrating clear evidence of gender bias. So you could say that this underrepresentation is not because women biologically are saying, I don't really want to do science. What their social brains are saying, let's have a look at this institution. Is this an institution where there's lots of people like me, where people like me will, will be rewarded, where we win prizes, etc.? Answer no. And so your traffic light system might say, perhaps this isn't for you. Let's have a look somewhere else. So what I'm saying is I don't think science has leveled the playing field, and that would be a better explanation. And until we do level the playing field, we can't actually sort out what the explanation is. Now we have a very nice short question from one of our regular questioners who asks, is this not all about nurture? Uh, thank you for the question, because it gives me an opportunity to say, please, no, it's not all about nurture. <laughs> one of the reasons that um, I wrote the book was because it had all been nature about the 1980s, second wave of feminism, biology is irrelevant, it's all to do with nurture, it's all to do with social manipulation, social pressures, um, social drivers, etc. What I'm trying to say is that it's neither. Now we know how um, powerfully the brain is affected 
buy it outside, and this is why I call it the outside-in model, buy outside pressures. We know that the brain and society are hugely entangled. So expert, and bearing in mind the babies arrive in the world, it's, it's much more tuned to what's going on around them than we ever realized. So things that look as though they must be late because they start early, um, we can see they are, you know, hugely effective social sponges, soaking up the methods, the, the messages in the outside world, and organizing themselves appropriately. Um, so no, it's not all about nurture, but it's saying we must pay attention to culture, society, if you want to call that nurture. But I'm not saying it's nothing to do with biology. I'm not, as I say, a sex difference denier in the same kind of terms like climate difference denier with the same consequences for civilization, I assume. So, no, it's not all about nurture. Now, I have a slightly longer question from someone who trained as a psychiatrist in the early 1980s when it was already established that the performance of men and women, for example, on IQ tests, shows minimal differences. Do you think that the continuing insistence that differences exist is largely propaganda by groups in society seeking a justification for retaining power? <laughs> there is a great phrase that if you've lived a life of, let me get this right, um, I'll have to think about it, I'll come back to it. Um, if, you, if you've lived a life of, of superiority, then equality can feel like oppression. So I think there's an idea that if there is power out there and evidence suggests that you should be relinquishing some of that power, that could be part of the pushback. Um, and I think given the, the power of some of the pushback and, and the very, as you can imagine, the very unpleasant messages that sometimes just on social media to me, but, but sometimes in, in bigger, um, the bigger arenas, a big pushback saying, um, a clever pushback, if you like, saying, we must find out why more women have Alzheimer's. Therefore, we need to study sex differences in the brain. Um, it, it, it gives a kind of credibility to saying, you know, stop telling people not to research into sex differences. What we're saying is you should be researching intersex differences, but understand that let that not be the only question you ask. Um, and therefore you need to pay attention to the fact that people have different levels of education, different occupations, different socioeconomic status, different access to healthcare. And those are the additional questions we should be asking. Otherwise we're gonna come up with the wrong answers. And, and just briefly on that, bearing in mind the time, Autism, which is my kind of day job, if you like, is a great example of how a particular filter can um, lead to uh, divert research down the wrong track. Always assumed that autism was primarily a male, male condition, early brain imaging studies only done on males. And yet it's emerging that it's really because there is this belief that it's mainly males. The diagnostic dice are loaded in favor of finding males. Whereas it's clear that there are females, girls and women who have gone for years, decades sometimes, unrecognized as being on the spectrum because everybody assumed you can't be autistic because you're female. So that's quite a, a good example of how a particular filter can divert or distract from understanding um, of the problem as a whole. Uh, the next question is from someone who's wondering if the variation within males or females has been shown across all areas of brain function to give the large overlap your chart shows, and if the small areas of non-overlap, just a minute, J just let me read this properly, sorry about this. Um, Wondering if the variation within males or females has been has been shown across all areas of brain function to give the large overlap your chart shows. Yep. And if the small areas of non-overlap distinct to specific I, I, areas. I, I think I think I, I can get the handle on that. Yeah, I mean I think um, certainly in human brains, there's some studies done by Daphne Joel, Tel Aviv, uh, three years ago and publishing since demonstrating what my belief is, is that actually every brain is different from every other brain. Because people say, well, if you think male and female brains are not different, you say male brains are the same as female brains. I'm saying, no, every brain is different. Everybody in this room, their brain will be different 
from the person they're sitting next to, even if that person is their identical twin, it doesn't like we have anybody like that. But yes, because everybody's brain will have had different experiences, identical twins may have had more similar experiences, as they get older, they may vary. So I think that's important. Uh, certainly in humans, there are, you know, the evidence is that our brains are much more like a mosaic of different characteristics. Um, and I think, so I think that, that is where we're moving. But it ought to be, should we get away from thinking in terms of melody? Are we losing much more interesting data by first of all saying, well, let's put our participants into a male category or a female category. So we need to be much more nuanced about it. I hope that answers the question. We have a question which is perhaps a little unfair on um, Gina in that it's about a bill currently in the Scottish Parliament, and of course, Gina uh, living um, <laughs> in the English Midlands. Believe it or not, we do get to hear what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so, the question is the proposed Gender Recognition Act currently in the Scottish Parliament is causing a lot of agitation about the concept of self identification, with some women's groups expressing concerns relating to what they see as potentially dangerous intrusions of persons who were assigned male sex at birth into female spaces. <laughs> what do you propose as a way of resolving such concerns? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so just an easy question there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, is it tomorrow that you've got to get home? <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, uh, as you can imagine, uh, this whole issue is something to, to which my work is, is, is relevant. But... My argument, taking my perspective, one of the things I'm trying to undo is, if you remember the very early chain of argument was how sex gets to be gender. The assumption that there was an inevitable link between um, the anatomical differences at birth, which got mainly individuals uh, allocated to be male or female, um, an inevitable link to the kind of brain you had, inevitable link to skills you had, inevitable link to where you could be in society. That being identified in the 1980s is, is, if you like, gender, and that could include um, gender roles, it could include um, uh, sex, sexual orientation, a whole, the whole link of, of, of behaviour. And interestingly, the term gender, where we used to only use sex to talk about um, that particular chain of arm, the term gender is now used in that way as well. So we talk about gender reveal parties, which of course aren't gender reveal parties, they're sex reveal parties, which may get people to think about something else. But anyway, let's move on. I think um, it's, it's difficult because for me, I would say the transgender community um, are really demonstrating that we should break that link between sex and gender. But within that conundrum, is the idea that quite a lot of the transgender community wish to link themselves to a particular biology. So instead of saying biology is irrelevant to who you feel you are, uh, et cetera. And then people say to me, so what do you think about it? And I say, well, I've been a neuroscientist all my career. So clearly I think biology is important. What we need to talk about is how important it is, the consequences it has for people's gender identity. And in a way, that's all what conflated with the idea of safe spaces. Um, and it's, it's driven people into quite defensive silence, if you like. And the idea is, as some of you may know about the uh, professor of philosophy in the University of Sussex in the last few weeks has, has, has had to resign or has decided to resign her post um, because of the, the kind of toxic nature of the argument. So it's really unfortunate. It's an argument which has got very strong, really interesting scientific threads running through it, but has got conflated with an assumption that if you say, I think biology is relevant, therefore you're transphobic, has driven people who would be very supportive of some of the arguments, you know, away from that argument or have been accused of, of, of different um, interpretations of the data. Safe spaces, I think, is, is something which is very much a political argument and really needs to be properly debated. But it's going to be difficult to debate it unless the people concerned come together and say, let's have a look at where we agree, let's have a look at where the difficulties emerge. 
So that's a very long answer to say I've got absolutely no answer to the conundrum, I'm afraid. But I obviously am aware of it. Um, we have one or two more questions online, but I'm going to take some from the floor. We didn't quite catch could you, could you could you could you take his mask off? Sorry. <laughs> Is there any physical way of looking at a brain, dissecting a brain, to tell whether it's male or female? Uh, no, it's a short answer. I mean, I think in a human brain we're talking about, um, and, and certainly... Um, anatomical studies would confirm that. So you can't pick up a brain. The only thing you might get a clue about is uh, on average, uh, male brains are about 10% bigger than female brains. That is a sex difference, uh, but that's because on average, males are about 10% bigger than females. And so, you know, small females have small brains, big females have big brains and ditto. So no anatomically. With respect to the data I was talking about, brain imaging, if you look at MRI structures, fMRI, which is some of the functional differences, um, the, the dump the dimorphism paper that I talked about was looking at MRI. I would say that uh, the kind of techniques that I use, um, which is MEG, magnetoencephalography, may lead us a bit further towards understanding some of the differences, because there clearly are differences. I'm not saying there can't be any differences. What we don't know is how those differences contribute to the gender gaps we're interested in. So I think once we have much more refined brain imaging techniques, which we now have, but once we combine them with, for example, gene expression techniques, um, metabolic profiles, uh, hormonal profiles, uh, immunological profiles as well. I think once we get a much more complicated but nuanced measure of brains, then we might be able to say with that kind of profile, I would think that that brain is male or I would think that female, that brain is female. They are trying that with some machine learning uh, techniques at the moment. So not allowing, you know, allowing on the human brain to look at itself as it were. Um, but they, once you've corrected for size, machine learning techniques possibly accurately identify brains as either from males or from females about 60% of the time, which given that you can actually ask people <laughs> without going into all of that, isn't a, it isn't a great record. So no, that's the key thing. I think that was absolutely key. It was always assumed that Male and female brains were different long before people, I mean, probably because people couldn't see what they looked like. So pink and blue brains, forget them. Do we have, yes, the lady there, one more question from the floor. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I'm uh, very much just saying that uh, that the brain is ungendered, uh, sociologist, and so forth. I suppose I have an occupational predisposition to think that it's mainly culture that creates these gender problems. Um, having got to that point, I'm also someone with a mother, um, and I thought it was extremely interesting how I have four white ladies, and I was already a feminist. I could not dress my boy babies in pink. I could dress my girl baby in blue, but I couldn't dress my boy baby in pink. There was a, a, an emotional barrier there. And it, it wasn't just because I don't like pink, it was just yep. <laughs> And it was to do with the power of society, yep. defining that this was the wrong thing for me to put my boys into, uh, and upsetting people. Would feel that I was breaking either with some kind of traditional female community or, or with some other ones about how boys would be dressed. And I think I have a question. My question is this How are we going to 
change so that we produce the sort of reflexivity. And then we are aware of this and we counteract these kinds of barriers yep. to gender equality. Okay. So that question was from someone who is quite convinced that there is no difference um, between males and female brains, but had concern when she had children that she could dress her sons girls. in blue. She could dress her girls in blue, but she could not dress mm -hmm. her boys mm -hmm. in pink. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, that's very interesting. And there is an asymmetry in uh, gender stereotypes. Uh, I think, as I mentioned briefly, Lego has very recently declared that they're going to stop gendered um, targeting, um, gender toy marketing, uh, in particular, because they did a big survey and they found that the stereotypes were harmful in terms of girls... Um, lacking spatial experience because they weren't encouraged to play Lego. But they also found that there was an imbalance in terms of um, whether or not girls could be encouraged or would, people wouldn't mind if girls played with boys, boys' toys. And that was generally found. Whereas parents got much more concerned if boys wanted to play with girls' toys. So much more discouragement of boys playing with dolls than discouragement of girls playing with Lego. So complicated story, but there is a clear asymmetry. Um, and I think that's, that's important. And clearly we need to address that, particularly because, I mean, one of the things, the questions we're asking about mental illness, you could say there's clear evidence that whatever the stereotypes are doing for males or females, they're not serving them all well. Because we could say, well, if everybody's, you know, living their life of efficacy and joy and girls are really happy being stepped to Type wives and boys are really happy, um, you know, leading the world. But there's huge evidence of um, gender di differences in depression and, and um, suicide rates in, in young males, etc. So clearly, something that needs to be addressed. So the discouragement of boys from playing with dolls, for example, is certainly something that needs to be addressed. And I think one of the key issues is, and organisations like Let Toys Be Toys, is not saying, um, you know, we must let boys play with girls' toys and girls play with boys' toys. What they're trying to say is just get away from the ideas that there are toys for boys and toys for girls. These are all toys that everybody should be encouraged to play with because they all have a different role in training, in you know, playing with dolls and, and social um, interactions around the doll's house, for example, can encourage uh, social activity or socialization skills. Um, Lego and, and Super Mario video games can encourage construction and, and visual spatial things. So in a way, people are talking about gender neutral, because I think as well as Lego, I think California has come up with a really poor compromise. Big, t big uh, department stores, I think more than 500, staff or something they can still have a blue aisle for boys toys and a pink aisle for girls toys but they've also got to have a gender neutral aisle now you just think what a stupid <laughs> stupid conclusion let everything be gender neutral just stop labeling things for boys and girls because children pick it up really early i mean there's a really interesting study so i'm going on a bit but um where parents in one room were asked to rate how you know woke they were with respect to didn't mind what their boys and girls did, what they played with. Groups of fathers saying didn't mind if the, you know, more than 60% of the fathers saying they didn't mind if their boys wanted to have ballet lessons or wear dresses. Next door, their little four-year-old boys were being asked, do you think your father would mind if you wanted to play with a doll? Less than 6% of the boys agreed that their fathers, who were claiming themselves to be really woke, would mind if they played with dolls. So children will pick this up, whatever the message is, children pick this up really carefully. So we have to be really clear about the message. And people talk about gender neutrality, and I think the only way forward is gender irrelevance. But the trouble is with that, it's a real kind of white, don't think of the white bear problem. You know, what we must do is make gender completely irrelevant by talking a lot about gender. <laughs> Right, well, we've had a marvellous talk and some marvellous questions. I can only apologise to the people who are putting questions that we do not have time for any more. But I hope that that talk from Professor Rippon has 
got your brain, whether it's male, female or neutral, into action mode and you're busy thinking about what she has said. So thank you very much for that talk. Could I just say that I think my email address was at the beginning of the slide. So if there's people who desperately want their questions answered, please feel free to email me and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thank you.